You know, a lot of what we've seen in the development of the theoretical academic world as well as the applied sciences world is we've had huge advances in well, these words you don't have a lot to lose on being machine learning and big data. We have now the ability to understand in incredible detail the unique patterns of what every individual in medical records in health systems should be doing, as well as when it year off, of course. And this is a huge advantage that a lot of health systems, for many legitimate and less good reasons, are just really not able to leverage at the moment or not leveraging. And so, in many ways, a lot of those technologies that do that prediction and prevention are, are out there, but part of the challenge is saying, how do we get healthcare to adopt them? How do we educate the market on how to tackle these problems more intelligently? And how do we also make it more commonplace, more well understood type of tool? Yeah, the Bayer analytics, as, as uh, you mentioned, is a, a big factor. It's an up and coming technology that you know, analyzes data streams to look for anomalous behavior and can be directed to specifically look at you know, virtually anything from the behavior of IT systems to detect and prevent uh, cyber activity, as well as user activity to determine whether your users might be perhaps participating in things like uh, patient data snooping or, or you know, celebrity type of snooping, as well as directed at patterns of behavior of hospital personnel on the on the floors for systems like connected pharmacy systems and so on. So I mean it does have a lot of promise. I agree that the challenge is really taking it from you know the the consolidated high level healthcare provider to you know the the large scale uh, organizations, the bureaucracies that have been created in healthcare, and then driving that down to every local hospital and, and uh, doctor's office. Because, I mean, there's always, they're always going to gravitate toward the, you know, the biggest chink in the arm. Do, do, do you think that um, the health sector is any more or less, um, I guess, advanced or on the curve in terms of adopting these technologies, or is this pretty good news across the health sector? I mean, I would say, if anything, that was actually pretty severely behind in many ways. And again, for some, for some good reasons and for some reasons that are more institutional and bureaucratic, as you mentioned, um, healthcare, if you look at it, at over just the last eight years, right, they've had a huge amount of incentives. $30 billion went from government incentives and obviously much more towards the adoption of electronic health records. So all this technology, all this digitization of patient data, but very, very little. That money ultimately went to privacy and security. And practitioners are going around their heads. I mean, it's, it's something that we know is the truth. And now there's so many mandates, so many demands from so many different systems, many of which are really important, really legitimate. And so they're getting hit from all sides. And in many cases, there's not that similar mandate for privacy and security. And so a lot of what we have to do is transform that conversation to ensure that those are prioritized and incentivized in the same way. Because it's not like they're operating on huge margins. I mean, they've got businesses to run as well. Yeah. So, segueing off of that, um, we've heard a lot of talk over the years about the importance of building security into systems and into softwares um, from day one. But it's something that, across the board, uh, I don't think anyone can point to an industry or, or, a, um, or an organization that's really kind of uh, knocking it out of the park, so to speak. Um, Ron, can you talk a bit about the 8160 that, that just came out uh, and how it addresses some of those problems? Well, I guess we're, uh, we're taking a little bit different approach. Um, you know, when you look at the complex infrastructure that we've built and uh, all the panelists previously talked about the threat actors, and we've been collecting threat data for a long time. We know, we know as much about the adversaries as we need to know. Uh, there's not much more we can learn. Uh, we can reverse engineer stuff and we can try to find out how they got in and what they did, but what we're trying to do is come from a different uh, angle. We're trying to say, let's do it the same thing we do for bridges and airplanes. You know, when you get in an airplane and you fly, and you go across a bridge, if you're in Washington, D.C. or anywhere, you've got a very high level of confidence you're going to land and you're going to cross that bridge safely. So the publication that we've been working on for four years, it really answers the question, how do you actually build security into systems from the start. And see, the problem with intrusion detection and response is that as the complexity of the infrastructure grows, and, and a metaphor for that, just look at your smartphone and your tablets. 
Forget about the big healthcare systems. Just look at the number of applications you have on those devices. Those things can continue to grow over time. And when you expand the attack surface, this means everything from connecting up your refrigerator to your garage door opener to uh, uh, power plants and financial institutions, healthcare. This infrastructure is growing at a rate that it's outstripping our ability to understand what we built. And that's dangerous because increased complexity equates to increased attack surface. The adversaries just flat have more opportunities to attack, and you can sit there playing the walk and game forever. They're the best tools on the planet will never keep up with the number of vulnerabilities that we're building into this infrastructure. So that's a, that's a cultural problem we have to deal with. What we're doing at NIST in the new document, and it's on the website today, it's a system of security engineering document. And we're really talking about how to manage and reduce complexity to the point that you're building something you can trust, just like the airplane you fly in the bridge across. That's going to take some work because the culture is pulling us to all of the great new technologies, electronic health records. All these things are really compelling. They make us more efficient, they do a lot of cool stuff. But on the other hand, we're building a very dangerous world that we're going to have to live with. Uh, the security and privacy that we enjoy in the paper-based world is pretty much not there anymore. And so that's the whole driver of the Ingrid 160. Um, it's on the website today. It's been final draft and will be finalized by December. And it's targeted for three different sectors. It's targeted for industry, folks that build products, and build systems, integrators, for example. It's targeted at the academic community because you can actually build a curriculum on how to teach people to build more secure, more trustworthy systems. So it comes to the computer science departments, computer engineering departments, and all the things that where the, that those skills come from. And it's targeted to government. That's the essential partnership: government, industry, and academia. Can't solve this problem all alone by government. Industry can't do it by themselves. This is going to be a heavy lift. There's no doubt about it. It's going to take a lot of work. It's not going to happen overnight, but this is our initial contribution in that uh, discussion. And I will say that um, ICIT uh, has been supporting uh, Ron and his team on this from, from day one. Um, they just put out a 20 page uh, condensed version of the paper. So if you want to get a, a feel for it first, I think the first section of the paper, I forgot what it's called, but have a good, good summary. You can read our summary as well, and then and then take a couple days to really dig into the Thank you, Ron. So, um, shifting gears a bit in terms of our continued discussion on these solutions uh, to defend against threats, uh, we talked about this in the first panel uh, as well about uh, the role that personnel and humans play. Sometimes they're often referred to as the weakest link, but with the Institute, we think that with proper training and resources, they can actually become your, your best line of defense. Um, so, again, ask the panelists to, um, to share either a NIST perspective or industry perspective on um, how we can better arm our personnel um, and the non-technical staff in organizations to uh, be, a, be a cyber asset, not a, a, a thorn in our size. <laughs> I go back to the uh, document, even though it's an engineering document, the first two processes within the engineering world goes back to the board. It's called mission, business analysis, and stakeholder, stakeholder requirements, stakeholder needs. And if we ever want to solve this problem, we have a tendency to outsource security problems to the CIO and as a staff officer. The mission business owners need to own the security problems. They're so fundamental to the organization because everything we do depends on information technology being dependable. And if that technology is not trustworthy and dependable, that mission business is going down as sure as I'm sitting here today. So the trick is to get those security professionals a seat at the table and not try to push all these things from the bottom up, but engage the, the, the stakeholders, the senior leaders in the organization early on. When you first start to think about building that new system or doing a major upgrade, your security folks are there as stakeholders, but as, as participants. They're in the trade space discussions. You can't do all the security requirements or all the controls because it will affect our mission or it's too expensive. You have the discussion so a stakeholder, when they're finished with that discussion, they understand exactly the level of protection they're getting. It's part of their risk-based decision-making, and they can go forward in a transparent manner knowing that they've done everything they can do. I would argue today that that discussion doesn't happen, at least initially, and it may happen too late, 
before you can actually affect that system and how it's protected. So that's my suggestion. Get it done early and involve your security people as key stakeholders. What I've experienced in all service security environment though is that people in a given organization, be healthcare or otherwise, number one value their mission, number two value convenience, and number three value uh, oh yeah, security, right? Um, so it's important to uh, to relate uh, all the measures that Ron spoke about to the mission itself, and also, especially in an urgent situation like a healthcare provider or hospital, make sure that the conven convenience is more than just convenience. It's making sure that the patient is taken care of. You know, I, I don't want to be flatlining while my uh, nurse or doctor is messing around with an ID card trying to get it to work. You know? At the same time, I don't want to be flatlining while the uh, machine down the hall is just uh, so uh, I think that relating to the mission uh, and how security actually enables the mission uh, are critical with psychological elements and training the community. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with what's been, what's been already said. I think you know, another tangible thing that we see is really effective in organizations that do as well is literally ensuring the seat at that boardroom table when it comes to security and privacy. One of the most tangible reflections of the fact that this is not the case in healthcare right now is if you look at the budgetary allocation of uh, healthcare versus other industries that handle similarly sensitive amounts of data, you're talking a third to a quarter of the type of IT and security budget that you ultimately need. And ultimately, that is a decision that goes up to the suite, C suite, it goes up to the board. And you don't have that direct line, that direct advocacy, you don't really see that transformation. And once you do, once that voice is there advocating for that um, as a strategic priority, I really think there's a lot of change that can happen throughout the organization. Yeah, so the, it's clear the personnel problem is, is a big one, right? Just generally in breaches, 43% of data breaches are due to some sort of end user or um, you know, user problem, right? Either <laughs> malicious behavior on a subset of those, the, the vast majority is generally, you know, just improper use of technology and carelessness. In the healthcare sector, clearly that's got to be a huge challenge because the primary mission and education of most of the personnel is, has nothing to do with IT. Uh, the 90% of hospitals that experience some sort of data loss, a large percentage of those was these portable devices that they use in the hospital to bring to the patient bedside being walked off with. Right, so fundamentally, you can eliminate a lot of problems. Right? Training has to be a, a, a critical part of it, but you know, a race to encrypt data at rest is, is critical, as well as to really understand what your attack surface is. As Ron said, right, you have, you know, as the Internet of Things, right, and in the hospital, that's, you know, uh, ultrasound machines and MRI machines, there's just rush to connect everything to the network. Despite the fact oh, you only, and hopefully at least you have this, you only have a plan to remediate patch and you know, typical devices, typical identified computers. But there's computers in everything. So but I think you need to do the training where it's appropriate and secure the devices to prevent the sharp edges from you know, cutting when you're dealing with personnel who just don't understand fundamentally what the issue is. So, um, in closing thought, in the last few minutes that we have, um, you see a lot of organizations out there trying to, you know, sell their products and kind of claim to have a silver bullet solution that will solve all the organizations or industries. You know, we know that's not the case. You know, there's a paper that we talk about uh, layer security strategies. Um, however, there's also the reality within most any organization, including healthcare, as, as, as uh, Robert mentioned, that resources are limited. And so, how do my question is, how do you? Uh, recommend that organizations prioritize um, their spend, um, be it dollars or you know, time out of the office for training or whatever it may be, how can they prioritize to actually start to uh, make a difference and increase their um, resilience? It depends a lot on organization. I mean, of course, that's the wishy washy answer, but when you look at hospitals, you see the, what, the first thing you have to do is understand what is their security posture right now. They have a basic quantum and tagline that they have to do, right? Are they still in the early stages of setting up a security operation? Did they just hire their CISO six to 18 months ago? I mean, this absolutely happens still in um, 
Now, ultimately, what has to happen is an understanding of what are your true attacks. What we tend to see is a lot of focus on the network and traditional cyber, but not as much focus when it comes to the inside of it. And in fact, for healthcare, this is in many ways the largest problem because the electronic health record has this unique quality of, because of the need to have it in emergency access situations, you can't really lock it down when there's robust rule-based access control as other types of systems. We often don't even know the root of those of individuals in healthcare because there are so many and they're so complex. In addition, people often change roles really dynamically throughout the day, throughout their career, throughout a very short period of time. And so what we tend to see is there's often a need to look more at that inside of the as you mentioned earlier, whether it's the VIP threat, whether it's the inside of the diverted medical records, the dark web as we've seen out there, whether it's individuals just snooping on each other. All of these can be multi-million dollar problems for hospitals bottom lines. And they can be huge, lifelong problems for the patients. Well, you know, the basic blocking and tackling is uh, missing from many organizations in healthcare. So, if I were to prioritize, I would say, well, item one, let's get the basics in place. Uh, there's a famous video I've seen by a, a former Navy SEAL who talks about how SEALs have to make their beds every morning and they have to be, be inspected. And he said, why would, uh, why would a Navy SEAL care about what their beds make? Idea is, well, if you can't do little things right, the big things aren't going to go so well either. So, if you're not patching your systems, if you don't have firewalls in place, if you don't have mail gateways to catch phishing attacks, uh, if you don't have a disaster plan uh, in place, if you don't know what to do in a disaster, you're, you don't want to be figuring out how to fly. So, those are the basic blocking and tackling that you know, the risk of getting a terrible fun, cyber hygiene uh, that needs to be in place uh, before anything else. And, uh, Disturbing the large number of healthcare organizations don't actually have that. Any other final thoughts on that before we move on? All right. Well, please help me in thanking our panelists.